Uh, we got Dr. Brian Burroughs, Michigan Trident Limited Executive Director, and Dr. Uh, excuse me, Dan Eckinger, uh, Michigan DNR Director. And uh, both of them are going to be speaking pretty soon. We've got Lance Climey, who's going to start things out with us. And um, thank hey, hey. you all for joining us. And uh, Lance, you can probably go ahead. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. This is the third of five Zoom events that Schrems is having this spring. Uh, we've got a couple more coming, and that's all detailed on our webpage. But tonight is our third annual State of the Trout event. Uh, again, we've been delayed a little bit because of COVID. But we are glad to welcome back Dr. Brian Burroughs, who's the Executive Director of Michigan Trout Unlimited, to join us, who's been with us now. This will be the third time in about four years. Uh, specifically, we want to hear about the State of Trout in Michigan. Uh, joining Dr. Burroughs tonight is Dan Eichinger, who is the Michigan DNR Director. We're very glad to have him here. But this time, I'm going to invite Dr. Burroughs to jump in and tell us all about the state of trout in Michigan, please. All right. Well, hey, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it is really, really nice to be um, uh, in front of all of you to uh, talk trout tonight. Uh, last year has been kind of a long year. And um, no chance to be in front of uh, TU members to talk trout. So this is, this is nice, even if it is electronic. Uh, so thank you guys for the opportunity. Um, I was just going to tell you that, uh, yes, my name is Brian Burroughs. I, I have been the executive director uh, of Michigan Trout Unlimited, which is the state council of all of the local chapters since 2007. And uh, tonight, um, I'll try my best to live up to the, uh, the auspicious title of uh, State of the Trout and share with you some information uh, about uh, really our diverse fisheries and where they're at right now. Um, and uh, upon finishing that, I'm going to introduce uh, Director Eichinger uh, of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and let him also share some thoughts and information uh, from his perspective with you. And when we, uh, when we wrap up, we'll be glad to take some, some questions. Um, so if you're ready, um, I'd start out um, kind of specific. I'll try to do a little round uh, round robin of some of our uh, our cold water species, and then I'll go to some some broader issues. Um, so, um, state of the trout in 2021. Um, I would start by saying that in the last year or two years, the good news is that we we haven't had, uh, at least across the board on all of our rivers, any significant extremes. And so by that, I mean either extreme hot summers, extremely cold uh, winters. Um, and I know that while some of our rivers have had some, some sort of odd uh, flooding events, especially last fall, um, across the board, we haven't had some of our worst floods either. So what that means is that um, we're looking uh, to be in pretty good shape as far as a lot of our fisheries go. Um, we have learned in Michigan that one of the, the biggest things that determines how well your trout population does is whether or not you get big spring floods. So as, the, as trout, salmon, or steelhead eggs are in the gravel, becoming ready to hatch, or whether they're yolk sac or very young juveniles, if we get a big spring flood level, it causes a tremendous amount of mortality at that early phase and we can really lose most of a year class. Um, and, and that usually ripples down the line, right? Brook trout live around three years, three to four years on average. Brown trout can live six, seven, maybe even eight or nine. So when we do have those events, you can miss a year class. Three years later, you can wonder where all the 14 to 18 inch uh, brown trout are. Five years, six years later, you can wonder why nobody that you fish with can find a 20 inch brown trout. Um, so the good news, uh, at least for brook and brown trout fisheries, is that we've had two years without, um, without extremes. And what that typically means for us uh, is, is normal conditions, good trout populations. Um, we are just starting to see some of the survey data from last year. And remember, uh, last year was COVID year and field work was pretty severely um, cut down across the board uh, for travel reasons, obvious reasons. 
but we are starting to see some of the, the results from those surveys come in and they're showing what we would expect, uh, pretty average uh, brook and brown trout numbers. Some of the rivers seem to be maybe just below long-term averages. We're not at extreme highs and we're not at extreme lows. So right now um, you can expect for, you know, a lot of your brook and brown trout fishing to be at pretty good, um, pretty typical levels. And um, while average doesn't sound good, um, you know, these days the average is, the average is real good. Um, so that's kind of what I, what I would share with you about brook and brown trout fisheries. And, and later on, if you have questions about particular ones, um, you know, that'll be fine too. Um, let's see, steelhead. Um, I'll paint a little bit different of a picture with steelhead. Um, as, as all of you know, we have a lot of steelhead fisheries in the state of Michigan. We're pretty blessed to have an, an incredible amount of wild steelhead reproduction. We also stock steelhead. Um, in, some, uh, in, in some facet of it, the rivers that we have that do rely heavily on stocking, they are still fine this year. They'll be fine next year, but because of COVID, uh, eggs were not able to be taken. And so um, they weren't stocked last year. And so a couple years from now, we'll probably have a year where steelhead runs are, are you know, low on some of those rivers that really rely on stocking. On most of ours that are mostly wild, you won't probably notice anything. Um, the other problem with steelhead fisheries is that we often don't know nearly as much as we would like to, to manage them. It's pretty tricky to go out into Lake Michigan or Lake Huron and, and sample steelhead to, to come up with precise estimates. It's also pretty difficult still to do that in rivers. Um, it's pretty cost intensive to count steelhead returning to rivers. So we can count juveniles before they leave the rivers, but a lot happens um, from that time until they come back. In, in recent years, <clears throat> we do, um, we have seen some declining trends in steelhead numbers. So one of the principal places where we do get information about the steelhead run is from the Little Manistee Weir. We also get a little bit at the Platte, sometimes some at the Boardman, but we, we, we have seen several years of declining steelhead returns. That's, that's a reason for concern. Um, one of the difficulties though is knowing whether that's happening in all of our rivers or just a couple of our rivers. Um, I, I, starting last fall and through the winter, heard a lot of reports from people who had pretty poor steelhead seasons and who were very frustrated um, with the fall run of steelhead in quite a few of our rivers. Um, but on the flip side, I, I did hear from some, you know, even full-time guides that said, yeah, it wasn't high, but um, it wasn't bad either. So obviously right now the spring steelhead run is underway, playing out um, from the best I've heard, it might be halfway through, maybe the peak hasn't happened. It's happened in a few places, not in others. So the verdict is still out, um, you know, not unlike you, not that scientific, but I've, you know, I've heard from some folks this spring, um, sort of uh, sharing some really good steelhead fishing reports from certain rivers that uh, made me jealous. But I've also begun to hear some concerns. And um, I believe about a week or so ago, I, I heard at least secondhand that uh, the steelhead run in the Little Manistee is, uh, is light and um, running a bit behind as well. So I would just leave you with the impression that steelhead, um, we still have a lot of steelhead. We still have great steelhead fisheries, but steelhead are probably an area of growing concern that we would probably be wise to invest some extra attention and discussion into going, going through 2021 and beyond. All right, so i um, not sure how many people enjoy salmon fishing. I do. Um, the status of Chinook salmon fishing is that um, the trend for the last two, three, four years is, is holding up this year as well. So as a recap, um, Chinook salmon rely heavily on alewife for prey fish. Alewife populations were under a lot of stress and were very low because 
<clears throat> because of L, um, sorry, zebra and quagga mussels, which filter out an awful lot of the plankton food base, the alewife rely on. So as alewife got stressed, in Lake Michigan, we tried to decrease the rate of stocking of Chinooks to decrease the predator pressure on them. We, did, we were trying to avoid a collapse similar to what happened in Lake Huron. Because we've been stocking fewer Chinook, um, there are less of them. The runs are lighter. People catch less of them in the big lakes. But on the flip side, the ones that are there are quite large. Um, we've been enjoying uh, people getting quite a lot of Chinook salmon into the 30 pounds and even a couple each year hitting about the 40 pound mark, which is pretty remarkable. Um, that seems to be the case again. Again, it's, it's pretty early to tell, but some people who have already been out trolling have already gotten some uh, kings this spring, again, that are already hitting the 20 pound mark in spring. So it looks like the Chinook situation is about the same as the last, say, two to three years. Uh, coho salmon, on the other hand, have really been um, pretty darn good in providing some really fun fisheries for people. Right this, uh, right this very moment, uh, in southern Lake Michigan, there seems to be just wonderful uh, near shore fishing. So people can get out trolling close to shore. People can fish the pier heads. And it, um, most of those coho are all kind of in southern Lake Michigan. And they, over the next month and a half, will slowly work their way up uh, northward up the Lake Michigan coast. And as they do, they start spreading out and dispersing. But uh, really, it's already started, and um, that will continue probably for the next month and a half. Um, in the fall, we've also seen some really strong coho runs. Um, that, that seems to be uh, creating quite a lot of uh, buzz on its own. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen, but uh, the last couple of years, some of the drone footage coming from, say, the Platte River um, and Platte Bay has been pretty dramatic with just how many cohos uh, are returning. Um, so that's sort of your outlook on, on the salmon for right now. Um, I'd like to talk about lake trout too. I'm going to skip over some of the Atlantic salmon and the pink salmon since they're, uh, they're important, but they're also a little bit more minor, um, minor fisheries. For lake trout, in Lake Superior, we still have our original strains of lake trout that evolved there. We have very special, unique strains that evolved in Lake Superior. And today we have a fairly stable lake trout popu population in Lake Superior. It's neither at historic highs, but we've recovered it a bit from historic lows. It's not growing quickly, but it's stable, okay? Um, now in Lakes Michigan and Lake Huron, it's a very different situation. As a reminder for everybody, we extirpated all lake trout from Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The ones that we have there are, are no longer the wild original strain. In the last five to 10 years, we have been seeing an increase in wild reproduction of lake trout in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And again, that's largely due to zebra and quagga mussels and the decrease in alewife abundance, making things a bit more favorable for lake trout. But importantly, I want you to know that as far as Lake Michigan or Lake Huron goes for lake trout, those fisheries, while, while showing signs of recovery, are not recovered. And those are both largely maintained by stocking. Federal agencies take the lead on stocking those as a recovery effort. And that recovery is not complete. So if you catch a lake trout, I would bet you, um, you have a greater than 50% odds, much better than that, that you are catching a stocked lake trout. So I, I would say on lake trout, one of the things I'd like to share with all of you is um, uh, I believe the biggest threat to lake trout today is from state licensed commercial fishing. So we have not had state licensed commercial fishing operations harvesting lake trout for a very, very long time, basically since they became extirpated and there was no fishery to be had. Right now, um, those remaining operations have been uh, legisla legislatively attempting to gain a portion of the available lake trout so that they can harvest them and begin selling. Right now, lake trout, do, again, because it's largely a recovery effort, 
the bag limits or harvest limits for anglers to split up and share have been pretty conservative. It's varied from one to three per angler per day, depending where in the lakes you are. So right now, <clears throat> if commercial fishermen, just a handful of operations get a large portion of that quota and can begin harvesting and selling it for profit, you can expect your opportunities as anglers to significantly decrease. Harvest limits and maybe even season lengths will have to go down as well. So that's an issue that is very alive legislatively. And then if any of you um, care to learn more and to uh, help advocate with your legislators, please contact me by email um, you know, at your convenience. Okay, so pivoting off of some of the species, by species information and into some general concepts. Um, hey, hey I, uh, Brian, can, can I interrupt just for a second? Uh, sure. Dave Young speaking. Uh, we, we had like uh, two or three questions kind of come up uh, sure. during that uh, regarding steelhead. Um, it would now be a good time to ask those or should we wait a little bit for you? Um, well, it's always good when, 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 we're, when we're covering it, but um, you know, maybe maybe time for, for one or two right now. And so I, I can keep answering questions forever and I want to answer everybody's, but <laughs> I don't want to get too far off track with time. It's your call. If you yeah. want to, uh, if there's one or two, I'll take them. Uh, they, they seem pretty pertinent to the steelhead. And I know you kind of uh, worked on that a little bit ago. Uh, we, have, we had one from Brian Kosminski. He asked, uh, you know, we've had some higher waters, uh, like Michigan levels are a bit higher uh, the mouth of rivers, uh, you know, does that allow for better, um, you know, predators in there? Does that account for less steelhead returns? Any thoughts on that? Uh, and, and maybe that's, you, you know, an unknown. We don't know. But yeah, I think it's, it's an unknown. Um, I think I think you would list that as an unknown right now. So um, like I mentioned, we we measure, I, I say we globally, I mean, meaning the DNR and, 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 and different stakeholder groups. We have the ability to go out and measure how many steelhead juveniles go out of our rivers. Once they go into Lake Michigan, it is very difficult to sample and understand them. And so you'll often hear, um, you'll often hear biologists sort of use the term um, the big lake black box. Um, we don't have as great of an understanding of all the dynamics and mechanisms that happen to those steelhead when they empty out of a river as we would like. So right now, um, you know, I would tell Brian that um, that's probably an unknown and, and his guess, his educated guess is, is probably as good as mine. Um, it's very possible that high water levels might be having some predator dynamic or, um, you know, could affect some plankton levels and steelhead could be having a harder time, you know, finding some of their required food in time. Um, at this point, it's a bit of an unknown what's going on. Yeah, uh, for sure. Difficult to tell. Um, so uh, one other question directly related to Steelhead, George Hartwell had asked, uh, is, does TU consider any sort of initiative about a bag limit on Steelhead? And that's, that's a tough question, right? Uh, yeah, so we will, we will be considering that. Um, you know, we, we take on anything that affects a fishery, right? So um, there are a lot of pieces into understanding whether a bag limit would be um, truly effective or, or not. Um, and, and we're going to be pretty committed to evaluating that, um, you know, as we go forward this year and next. Um, I think it's time, right? So on its face, it's a pretty simple question, right? If, if people harvest less fish, will that help make, their, um, make more fish? Yeah, right? But how much is a more complicated question. And um, oftentimes that takes a lot of creel surveys. So you understand how many anglers actually catch how many, and you can understand the dynamics and where to apply that pressure. But I would tell you that on a very general level, it is time for us to talk about that. You know, steelhead fisheries have always been important. They're an incredible, um, beautiful, inspiring game fish. Um, We've been a little spoiled in, in history with having great salmon abundance. And so steelhead could almost take a back seat as salmon numbers have declined. Steelhead have gone from important to super important. And if, and if they're showing signs of stress, 
if our angler catch and satisfaction is down, we have to talk about everything. And that includes harvest levels. Okay. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks. Um, yeah, uh, w one other question. Could, you just talked about uh, lake trout. And um, uh, there's a question from G. Walls about lake trout. And he says, given the low lake trout numbers in Lake Michigan in the presence of an apparently ancestral Lake Michigan strain of Lakers in Elk Lake, has the DNR considered attempting to raise the Elk Lake strain for potential planning in Lake Michigan? And maybe it's not your question or, or uh, question to answer, um, but- I, I will take a shot. There it is. Um, so I am not a lake trout specialist, but, um, Within the Michigan DNR, there is a, a fisheries research biologist named uh, Jory Jonas, and uh, I believe she helped discover that, that ancestral strain. And while I have not heard the most recent updates or research reports, I am positive that uh, there is work being done to evaluate whether they would be a good replacement, a more proper replacement. Um, or whether they would be good just to add into the mix for a diversity standpoint. I'm sure that discussion is ongoing, but I don't really have the particulars to update uh, right, right at this moment. And I can probably just follow in on uh, in, in um, Brian's slipstream there that, you know, it's just a, the other thing that's important to remember about lake trout is that that species is primarily, and by, when I say primarily, I mean almost exclusively stocked by the federal government. So a lot of our hatchery, you know, our hatchery programs are focused on, you know, trout, salmon, steelhead, walleye, that kind of thing. And lake trout are more the purview of the federal government. So it, it's just important to know kind of where the, the locus is for, for stocking effort for lake trout. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. And, and you know, Part of that whole process, there, there are whole lake management teams that involve multiple agencies and in looking at an ancestral strain of lake trout and figuring out whether we should shift back to that. You know, we do strain evaluation studies where, where people really want to know, well, that was the original, that might look like an original one, but how is it best adapted? What suite of conditions is it adapted to? Because you know, our Great Lakes today do not look like what they looked like 100 years ago or 200 years ago when those lake trout evolved there. Um, it takes a different set of behaviors to, to succeed there today. So a lot of careful study has to go into that. Any other questions for right now? Yeah. I, you know, there are some, but let's keep, you keep moving along. And uh, there's, there's some others that kind of apply to both and we'll, we'll get back to those, yeah. All right, all right. So <clears throat> pivoting to some more general concepts, I would just say that um, in Michigan right now, we still have an incredible abundance and diversity of cold water fisheries. Our portfolio, I believe, is better than any state in the country. You know, so we have, we have brown trout, we have brook trout, we have lake trout, we have rainbows and steelhead. We have Chinook and coho. We have pinks at Atlantic. Um, we have some other fish that we forget about like ciscos and, and whitefish and um, perhaps grayling someday. We have a big portfolio. We have in Michigan, we have a, over 70,000 miles of rivers and streams. It's believed that about uh, somewhere old, just over 30,000 miles of those support cold water fisheries. So 30,000 miles potentially of cold water streams in, in one state. And we have the Great Lakes and we have about 11,000 or more inland lakes. So we have a big portfolio. Really one of our situations that we find ourselves in today is we have a great portfolio, but our ability to fine tune them, any particular one of them, optimize their management in the way that we would like to do and are capable of doing or enhance any of them is really limited by the amount of financial resources, the number of people that we have, the grant funding, the data that we can collect, right? So we have to prioritize. We don't, we, we would love to do everything. Um, it's a dream, but we have hard choices to make all the time, but we have great resources and there is no shortage of things that we could do to make them better. 
Second, um, another stressor that I, I really do want to mention tonight is, um, is climate change. So it's no, 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 no unfamiliar ground for any TU member to know that uh, cold water fish have a lot of stressors, right? <laughs> they are, uh, we are not catfish unlimited. Um, trout, salmon, and steelhead take perfect conditions and everything, sometimes it can feel like everything goes against them. We are still honestly fixing stressors that happened 100 years ago in a lot of our streams. So we're not done with the past level of work, but there are some new ones like climate change that are emerging and, and they're here already, um, honestly quicker, quicker than expected. I'll explain, I'll explain one, and that, that has to do with how our weather is different. Um, our weather has changed. We do have some directional change, but we also have more extreme and more frequent variability than we've ever had before. I don't know how many of you are sort of weather weather nerds, but um, you know the jet stream doesn't do a gentle oscillation across our continent anymore. It does incredible amplitudes. So we get hot, we get cold, we get wind, we get storm events that are bigger and more frequent than we've seen. Hang on to that for a second. Now I want to make sure that you know that rivers and streams are, are an expression of a very delicate, fine-tuned balance between water and sediment. How a river looks is a function of how it receives water, how much water and when it gets it, and what kind of sediment is there or that it flows across. If you change one side of that balance by changing water, by changing rain events or weather conditions, you will change the sediment side. Rivers will look different if you change the water pattern or, the, or what we call the flow regime. So that's happening today. Um, I'll use one of my favorite rivers, for example, there's been a USGS gauge on it for I think 60 years, maybe 70 years roughly. And the two largest events um, recorded there have happened in the last 10 years. That's statistically not, not really supposed to happen. Um, and that's just happening across the board. So a few things that we're seeing uh, increasingly, I would say right now it's, it's only maybe once a month that I get uh, phone calls about it, but we are seeing, uh, beginning to see sand that has been stored in certain sections of streams, getting moved and deposited in other sections of streams where we haven't seen it. It's pretty common now that I get calls and Somebody will say, well, I've, I've either lived on this river or I've fished this section of river for 30, 40 years, and I've never seen you know, sand piling up here and here and here. It's not that it's necessarily new sediment inputs into the river, but as you get larger floods than we're used to, it does different things inside of a river and we're moving things and those rivers are adjusting. And I didn't want to believe that that was starting um, for another 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but it's unfortunately it's started. Um, and that's going to be a new challenge. Likewise, there's some other ways that climate change has thrown us a few curveballs. So as the weather has changed, agricultural practices can change. Um, in your area or West Michigan area, um, farmers that have traditionally grown commodity crops can be offered seed contracts. And with that, they have to install groundwater irrigation for those crops. So you can have more groundwater pumping in a watershed that pops up when we never really had that before. And that's because the weather changed. Likewise, in the spring, it's getting harder and harder for farmers to put the seeds in on time. So more people are investing in drain tiling. More drain tiling that happens, less groundwater recharge that happens. And so in a lot of different ways, I'll just tell you that this is a type of new stressor that's coming our way when we really haven't fixed uh, and finished our work with the historic ones. We have new ones and we have to be smart about that. We have to see them and, and get ourselves ready so that we don't suffer severe consequences from those. Um, and I'd like to end with just two opportunities too. Um, first, um, this last year, got a lot of people out fishing again. Whether they were truly new or they had walked away from it for some period of time, we have really experienced a large increase in angling activity. So there's, there's different people fishing. There's people fishing more frequently. 
Uh, some of the tackle manufacturers and retailers have had a hard time keeping stuff in stock. Um, I'm sure if you've made it out fishing, you've probably noticed an uptick in the traffic and the number of people around you. I think of that as an opportunity. I'm not sure within the last 60 or 70 years that we've seen you know, a period of time that has had such um, growth in angling across the board. Maybe a river runs through it, did that for the fly fishing uh, sector, um, but it's been a very long time since we've seen so many people get back out fishing. That needs to be an opportunity for us, right? We need to be there to greet them, support them and engage them so that we can grow, um, grow our ranks of people who are trying to put time into conservation. So that's a challenge to you and an opportunity in front of all of us. The second or uh, lastly, I would just remind you again that there is no shortage of things that we can do to make all of our fisheries better. Um, we have thousands of dams in this state. We have hundreds of thousands of bad road crossings that prevent fish from migrating. We, as I mentioned, we have over 30,000 miles of trout stream and almost all of those could, every single mile could probably be enhanced in some way. We're not out of things to do to make our fisheries better and more robust and healthier. Um, again, we are just limited in our capacity. And I would, I would also sort of let you know that um, this is uh, not to come across wrong, not, um, not to be bragging, just to be proud and, and realistic. Um, Trout Unlimited at local levels, state levels and national levels has been more productive in doing more work than I have ever seen. Um, I've been around for 14 years as an employee and another six or seven as a, a citizen of Michigan who is watching and participating. Uh, you all have a lot to be proud of. We are stepping up, we are working hard. We are also at max capacity. <clears throat> and so the only way to, to rise to the challenge, keep working hard, do all the things that we already know how to do to make fisheries better, but also meet the challenge of new stressors is for us to grow our ranks. We have to grow the people, we have to grow the resources, and, and we can do that. Um, our fisheries depend upon it. So um, that's, you know, that's the work that we have in front of us if we wanna keep um, the state of the trout great. So that's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's great. Uh, you know, and a question came in that really uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, addresses your uh, summary there. You know, what can people do to um, improve the cold water fisheries in their management? Is it call legislators, recruit other people, get involved? I mean, if you're going to do one thing or two things, what are those things? And, and some of them might apply to the state and that might be a good transition over to Dan as well. So yeah, what do you think? Well, thanks. I wanna, ask, I wanna answer that in a very sincere way. Um, every one of us has <laughs> our own unique combination of either money or time to give, right? Um, sometimes you have uh, money and no time. Sometimes you have a lot of time and very little money to give. It, it doesn't really matter which you contribute to conservation, that's up to you. Um, if you have no time, then, then money is uh, very helpful and it can be used by others who do know how and have the time to do it. But really for any of you who really wanna help, in an authentic way, I would say, just commit yourself to, to picking the river that you wanna work on, join TU, reach out to your chapter leaders, reach out to our staff at Michigan TU like myself and say, can you help explain to me how to be a leader and how to make things happen for this river. We have a framework, we have support tools and, and we would be there to help somebody be a leader, right? Bring other people alongside of you and the knowledge to, to figure out what each river needs is most in need of from you. There's a process and sure, it takes some time to, to understand how to maybe write grants or do assessment work or get help from the right people but that's what TU is. We're, if, if we're nothing else, we need to be a support framework for people who have committed themselves to making a difference on the waters that they care about. 
All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, we have a, a, a couple other questions, but we're gonna kind of move over uh, to, to Dan, because um, I'm sure he's got some great things to talk about as well. And we'll probably have some time left uh, to address uh, any other questions. And I'm gonna make sure that uh, I think uh, Dan's ready to go. All right, thanks, Dave. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Um, okay, that's good. Well, I'll just talk to everyone you. Everyone else is muted. <laughs> <laughs> right. I haven't heard any problems about audio, so I think. All that's right, good. that's good. Well, it's a real pleasure uh, to be with everyone uh, this evening, um, and to be, you know, to be speaking to um, to a you know a, an organization or a, you know a chapter or members of an organization that I'm also proud to be a member of. I'm a life member of Trout Unlimited. I belong to the Leon P. Martouche chapter uh, up here just down the road um, from my my home in Isabella County. So it's good to be among friends. And as I was scrolling through the names of the folks who are participating in the meeting tonight, there are some uh, folks that I know uh, know well. And and so it's, it's good to be with all of you uh, tonight. Um, you know, maybe I'll talk a little bit just for a second about myself. I'm an, uh, I'm an ardent fisherman. Um, as I, as I said, I'm a life member of TU. I, I grew up fishing on the, uh, fishing for brown trout in the middle branch of the Muskegon river. Um, my mom grew up in Marion, Michigan, and the middle branch flows right through, uh, Marion. And that's where I learned how to, that's where I learned how to fish. And, and, uh, that's why if you've ever fly fished me, it's why I cast so ugly. Uh, cause there's a lot of overhanging, there's a lot of overhanging material from, uh, the stream side vegetation. And so there's no other way to do it, but ugly. So that's, that's at least my excuse anyway. Um, there's a few things I want to, you know, just kind of give you all some updates on uh, things that we're working on in the department of natural resources. Um, and I, I want to make sure we save some time at the end. So, so that we can answer your questions that you might have for me. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the, one of the issues that um, I think Taylor mentioned in, in her question is, you know, what, what have we seen in the last year in terms of, you know, growth and interest in the outdoors? And it's, it's interesting to me that here we're about one year or so, 13 months, I suppose, uh, into the COVID-19 experience. And what has that meant for the Department of Natural Resources and our programming and for the interest in the work that we do? Uh, and for the community that we that we serve, and without a doubt, and Brian said it, you know, we have seen tremendous increase in in outdoor recreation across every category, um, and that's true on the hunting side. Uh, it's certainly true on the fishing side. Um, it's tr true on uh, the use of our state parks and our campgrounds. We were full wall to wall last year in our campgrounds. Uh, something has changed where people have now either fallen back in love with the outdoors and reconnected with an experience that they had earlier in their life or they're finding their way to nature for the first time. And as, as Brian said, uh, that presents a tremendous opportunity uh, for those of us who are members of this community to, you know, we've been searching for that for a long time to find out what it is that moves people to start taking up hunting or start taking up fishing or to get outdoors, to go hiking, biking, camping, whatever your thing is. And, and now we know who some of those folks are. And the challenge really now falls to us to figure out what it is that they need from us and how we can better, better serve and meet their needs so that they continue to be part of this community going forward. And the other thing that it does is it helps us to grow the army that Brian was talking about, that nothing you know, none of the conservation successes that we've had in this state uh, have happened accidentally. Now, people have had to demand that we take seriously and that we prioritize taking care of our natural resources and prioritize supporting people who want to get outdoors and supporting the activities that draw them there. And, you know, as we start to face some of the crises that that we really need to we really need to reckon with uh, in this 21st century of conservation, that army is going to have to be bigger than it is today. And it's gotta be more demanding than it is today. And so, you know, we need to take and kind of seize on the opportunity that's been presented here for us to do just that. And so for, you know, folks who are looking, you know, 
pick, take up Brian's call to arms, so to speak, and, and, and demand, you know, demand that this become a public, a public policy priority. You know, conservation in the outdoors and our natural resources have to be a priority for policymakers uh, in order for us to make those gains and people have to demand it. Uh, and so that's a true opportunity for all of us who, you know, love the outdoors and want to make sure that these are resources that are in well, you know, well cared for and in good condition. So kind of falling in line with that, you know, one of the, one of the threats that we've, uh, you know, we've been confronting or we knew we had to confront, um, you know, back at the beginning of my career 20 some years ago, you know, we talked about the universe of invasive species and aquatic invasive species in particular. And it was really, you know, we talked about sea lamprey, we talked about quagga and zebra mussels. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this looming threat of invasive carp that may find their way uh, into the Great Lakes and cause all kinds of trouble. And, you know, in, in the 20 years uh, since, since then, you know, we've seen a lot of things not happen on carp. And there are a lot of reasons for that. The state of Illinois never really wanted to get serious about what they had to do to prevent carp from moving into the Great Lakes. The shipping industry was incredibly powerful and frustrating that conversation. We couldn't land on what a solution was going to be to keep carp from moving into the Great Lakes until about 10 years ago when a study was done. Once physical separation of the lakes and sort of rerouting and re-engineering the, the Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal was off the table, we had to get real about what, what a physical barrier that was going to prevent and deter carp from moving into the Great Lakes would look like. So there's a study that was done uh, about 10 years ago, and it identified this one location in Illinois just outside of Juliet called the, Brand, uh, the Brandon Road Lock, the Brandon Road Lock and Dam, which is a facility that's maintained by the Army Corps, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And so for many years after that solution was identified, you know, we had been dealing with, you know, in, intractable state government in Illinois, didn't want to do anything about it outside of the state of Michigan and a few other Great Lakes states. We really couldn't get any traction in Congress to move the needle on, on invasive carp. And back, you know, before I took on this job, I worked for the Michigan United Conservation Clubs as the executive director and a few of us got together uh, and said, what, what the heck are we going to do uh, to move the needle on, on carp? And there were, so as MUCC, it was Trout Unlimited. Brian was in those conversations. Taylor Ritter, Ritterbush was, was in those conversations. You guys know Taylor. Uh, Ducks Unlimited uh, and Gito Torrey were in, the, in on those conversations. And then Mark Smith from the National Wildlife Federation. And we kind of hatched this plan where we were going to do, we were going to take what we did best in the state of Michigan, which was organizing the sporting community and try and export that idea to states like Indiana and Illinois and see if we could get the sporting communities there to start banging the drum and making noise on um, getting their policymakers to take seriously the need for us to do something about invasive carp. So we did that. And uh we started making trips to Indiana and we started making trips to Illinois and we got together with uh, sportsman's clubs and sporting groups and TU chapters and DU chapters and anybody else who would listen to us talk about invasive carp. And we organized a community. We went to DC and we lobbied on the Hill and, and the result of that was when uh, governor Pritzker in Illinois was elected the same time governor Whitmer came into office, we had created a groundswell of support and demand that we do something, that the state of Illinois do something. They, ne they needed to be the prime mover here about invasive carp. And within the first three, three or four months of taking office, um, Governor Pritzker indicated that he, he on behalf of the state of Illinois would be the non-federal local sponsor to make the Brandon Road lock and dam, the physical barrier that would prevent invasive carp from moving into the Great Lakes. He would take on that responsibility. Uh, but that responsibility was conditioned um, there, there's a pretty significant financial barrier that, that you have to overcome, uh, in order to make a project like this, get off the ground. And, and we needed to go through design and engineering, which in and of itself was going to be about a $30 million project. And the construction is about a $750 million project. So we're talking big, big time dollars here. And the, the state of Illinois said, you know, we'd love to help you out. And you know, yeah, sure, we'll be the non-federal local sponsor, but we can't come up with the cheese that we need to in order to be, you know, in order to even get the design and engineering phase off the table. 
And that's where, that's where we in the state of Michigan said, you know, that's a problem we might be able to help you with. So in the waning days of the Snyder administration, there was $8 million that was appropriated um, for the long-term operations and maintenance of the Brandon Road lock and dam system. But that money was only ever going to be needed if we ever got the project built, which was, you know, at, you know, at best, you know, six, seven, 10 years away. And so we, we got creative and we went to the state budget office and we got the governor and the legislature to agree to appropriate that money to us early so that we could meet 80% of the 20% that Illinois had to put on the table in order to get the project off the ground. So we signed an inter intergovernmental agreement with the state of Illinois to basically hand over $8 million of um, Michigan, uh, Michigan money so that we could initiate the design and engineering phase for the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. And in doing that, we didn't just we didn't just hand over a check, but we said, you know, our money comes with a condition now too. We want a seat at the table in every conversation that the state of Illinois has with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because we wanted to make sure that the values and the needs of our citizens and our residents were going to be met, and that Illinois wouldn't negotiate those away by you know trying to sand down the overall price tag for the project you know, make some design change that would decrease the efficacy of the barrier, those kinds of things. And after, I don't know, months, almost, you know, a year of negotiation, we finally got Illinois right before, uh, right before Christmas, we signed the intergovernmental agreement on Christmas Eve. Uh, we finally got them to agree to all of our terms and conditions, and we got that project underway. And concurrent with that, the organizing and advocacy work that I mentioned in Congress paid off as well because the, the Cong U.S. Congress authorized the Brandon Road project and now we're in the appropriation phase and the money the money's being appropriated and we're well on our way now um, to having the Brandon Road lock and dam become a reality. And so in a lot of ways, it's not, I don't want to mislead anybody. This isn't the end of the, that this isn't the end of the trail for us, but in a lot of ways, this is the end of the search for the trailhead, that we're now on a pathway that's gonna result in a durable physical barrier that's gonna prevent invasive carp from moving into the Great Lakes. We got more done on that issue in 20 months than we have in 20 years. And that's something you know I'm, I'm very proud of, but it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something that uh, wouldn't have happened without you know, the advocacy and the power of the voices of the sporting community in, in Michigan. And, and us being willing to take that, take the power of that advocacy and the power of those voices to Washington, D.C. and make sure that we were heard there and take them to the state of Illinois and Indiana to make sure they were heard there as well. So that's good news for all of us. And, um, and that also happened at a time when we were dealing with this, with this COVID crisis. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the other issues that I thought I would just uh, might touch on for a hot second here, and Brian talked about it as it relates to climate change. Um, the negative effects of climate change are already expressing themselves uh, all over the landscape. And we see that in the risks it presents to our cold water systems, uh, in particular that Brian, Brian talked about. We see it expressing itself in you know, the vulnerability and the fragility of some of our coastal zones. Uh, we see that, uh, I don't know if there are any grouse and woodcock hunters that are on, uh, on the call as well, but you know, we're seeing that in our state forest system as well with, you know, we're losing vigor in our aspen species and aspen are critical, you know, they are critical for part of the forest complex as we regenerate forest systems after we've done, you know, we've done uh, timber harvest and that kind of thing. If we lose vigor, in Aspen, we lose that structure and with it, all of the species that are dependent upon, you know, early successional young forest complexes for their survival, like grouse and American woodcock, you know, species that like to browse on Aspen like deer and elk. So climate change is something we got to take really seriously. And we got to start to articulate a body of work that's going to be, you know, laser focused on how we can steward the resources and the landscapes that we're responsible for against that backdrop of very rapid dynamic change. And so one of the things, you know, one of the things that we have to start to socialize ourselves to and get exercised around is the idea of, 
you know, accelerated pace of work. The, the pace of change that we see in the natural resources, you know, again, going back to, you know, the beginning of my career 20 years ago is, is so incredibly fast now. The landscape's changing. The universe of fish and wildlife diseases that we deal with, much bigger than it was 20 years ago. Invasive species, we talked about that, much different than 20 years ago. The accelerated pace of change as a result of climate, you know, changes in the climate, that's much faster than it was 20 years ago. And so we as an agency and we as a community need to be equal to that pace of change if we're going to be able to steward resources through that. And so, you know, as a, as a trout fisherman, I am particularly concerned and sensitive to the way that climate change is gonna, going to impact cold water systems and cold water streams. And so we're trying to get our agency in a position and our management, you know, and our management actions aligned with that pace of change. So we'll be, one of the places I, I fish a lot, I, I fish a lot in the Osable system. It's about, you know, it's about an hour and change away from my house. So I spend a good deal of time uh, up that way. And one of the things that struck me, and I've talked to, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks who, you know, are, are passionate about the ensemble, is that, you know, the cadence of management that we have that we have exercised in that place, and the expectations for cadence of management from our anglers are are not the same, and that's a problem for us. You know, when we don't have when 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 the when the, the cogs on the sprockets are not lining up with one another, we got a problem. And we can't be grinding against each other when we are confronted with the kinds of, you know, the kinds of change and the kinds of urgency and the kind of urgency that we need to be working with um, in the Osawa system. So I look at a place like that and I say, you know, here's, a, it's a cold water system. It's an aquifer driven. It's got a lot of fans. It's got a lot of people who have a lot of opinions and express a lot of values on that, on that river system. There is no better place for us to perfect what our contemporary 21st century fisheries management needs to be and our cold water system management needs to be than the Osable. So what we're, what we are undertaking, and I'll be I'm, I'll be a little coy and a little obscure because we are, if we had this meeting in like two weeks, I'd be a lot more detailed about, about the direction that we're headed in. But we've got to get the management and, you know, the organizations that are in orbit around the ensemble system in much better alignment and much more on the same page so that we can be collectively co-authoring a management framework for that system that is going to steward it through this backdrop of change that we all know is going to happen over the next 50 years. How do we keep that cold water system cold? How do we manage sediment? How do we ensure that the trout populations that live there today are thriving 50 years from now? If we stay on the same trajectory that we are today, we will not be able to make that statement. And that's what keeps me up at night. And so we're going to, we are undertaking uh, you know, something like a structured decision-making process where we're going to co we're going to co-author and articulate what management actions need to be from an agency standpoint, identify things that we need to learn more about that system and understand how it's behaving in response to management actions that we will take, how it's responding to things like Brian talked about high water events, um, much more, you know, a much shorter cycle for dramatic weather conditions. And, and be able to, to alter, you know, alter the trajectory of our management. And if we do that, and if we're successful, that's a model then that while the actions might not all be the same, that is a model that we will then need to export to every other cold water system and iconic cold water watershed that we have across the state of Michigan. So you could pick any system, that kind of, that kind of management structure where we're starting to align what people are seeing in the river from their waders with what our managers might be seeing from a satellite in space, and we're getting lost in we're getting lost in communication there, where the the perspective and the scope that our anglers see for river conditions is different than what our managers seem to be seeing, and nobody's wrong, but we're not communicating in like terms with one another, and so we need to solve we need to solve that problem so that that cadence of management can be mutually understood, mutually supported, and it aligns actions that all of our, you know, all of our chapters take for stream restoration work and, and other activities that you go out and write grants for. 
with with actions that graft onto this you know sort of bigger management objective that we have for stewarding these systems against this backdrop of change so that's that's something i've uh, this is kind of a passion project for me that we we get we get our cold water management caught up with the pace of change that we're seeing and the impacts that they have on our cold water systems. And, and we can't say that today. And that's that's a problem for us. And that's a problem that we as an agency need to be very clear eyed about and reflective about. Um, but then it also demands that that we reach we reach back out to our partners and say, we have always, you know, we have to move, we have to move together. Let's learn, let's learn about what our actions need to be together so that we are equal to the, you know, equal to this moment and equal to meeting this challenge of climate change. So there's just a couple of things quick and dirty that we're working on um, in, in the department. Um, but like I said, I wanna make sure we, we leave a goodly amount of time here so that we can get to your questions that you have for me and we can unpack any of these ideas and more that, that you might have for me. So thanks again, Dave, so much for the opportunity, Lance, the invitation, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, and uh, you know, you you hit a, a, upon a couple of really big topics. Um, you know, one is the Asian carp issue that that I think um, you know since we've been in COVID times has been not top of mind. You know, for good reason, right? And 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 it's great to see that uh, some action has been moving forward. Uh, and some of the things you mentioned there, I had uh, no idea that. Uh, had moved forward. Uh, the second one, you know, becomes a little bit more esoteric with climate change and how it's affecting things like you mentioned on the ensemble. You know, is that affecting everywhere? I, I, there's a lot of questions in there. We could go on for hours, I, I think, about, about that. Um, and we don't have that kind of time, I guess. Um, but but it is interesting, and it's great to see that the DNRs, uh, you know, working on that uh, throughout these times. So um, there were a couple of very specific questions from some of our folks um, that I think were worthy of taking a look at. And one is fairly recent, um, it come from uh, uh, George Hartwell about uh, the dam evaluation task force. Uh, I believe both you and Brian serve on that governor's task force. And, you know, is there a brief update? And since you're both on the task force, could it result in more state funding for dam removal? Yeah, I'll make sure Brian has a chance to jump in on this too, because he definitely was active in, in the dam safety task force. The I would say kind of the first iteration of that work, which is which is kind of what we've seen now, has really been primarily focused on um, dams that present a, hum a, a risk to human health and safety. And so, you know, and obviously that's necessitated by, you know, the situation in Sanford from a year ago. So it was, you know, one crisis layered on top of another that we were dealing with last spring. And it caused, you know, it caused state government, I think, to recognize something that we've all seen for a long time, that we've got a lot of really old crappy infrastructure that is impacting our, you know, our rivers and present, you know, presents and poses a threat to human health and safety. And that's a problem that we've been kind of coasting on fumes for, for a while, um, that everyone sort of kind of tacitly acknowledged, but no one really wanted to, to do the work. Because as Brian said, you know, we've got thousands of water control structures across the state of Michigan. Not all of them have a human health and safety risk. A lot of them have, you know, a lot of them, all of them have an impact on, you know, the ecological health and vigor of, of, of a river system. So this first body of work is really kind of focused on what does the, what kind of muscle does the state need to build out so that we are more adequately identifying and addressing those water control structures that present a health, a health and human safety risk. The part two of that, which is, which is the drum that, that Brian has been banging, uh, people like Bill Rustum have been banging it as well, is there's more to this story than dams that just present a human health and safety risk, which is not to minimize 
that issue at all. But there's part two that we need to that we need to do as well that, you know, if we're going to comprehensively look at the impact here, we also have to look at the impact that that these things have on, like we just talked about, you know, the ecological health and vigor of a river system, genetic diversity and fish species that live above the dam and below the dam. You know, those are all real impacts that we see. And so it would be, so that's kind of what I would say, like, I think part two is, is a little bit more of a deeper dive specifically in that area. Just generally speaking though, having elevated the conversation about dams, I think creates at least softer ground than what we've seen in recent years for us to have much more serious conversations about resourcing a very, very big problem. Um, the kinds of dollars that we're talking about to you know, successfully effectuate dam removal in all the places that dams need to be removed is an astronomically high figure. Now, there may be some opportunities that we can seize on in you know, some of the federal infrastructure conversations um, and, and that kind of thing so that we can, we can bring some resources to the table that we've been naive to for, for a long time. We'll certainly be looking for those opportunities um, and asserting that need. Um, so that's kind of where that's kind of where things sit right now. And Brian, I'll throw it to you if there's other stuff that you want to add in on that. Um, no, I think I mean that was that was that was pretty good. Um, you know, specifically, I would I would I would answer George and say that um, indeed, dam removal and the environmental cost of dams uh, factored very heavy into the task force work um and i think the report um you know and there was important overlays um you know i i, I in my comments earlier you know i i think about the fact that uh you know this year we get to remove a small dam that's warming the water during the summer by 10 degrees you know we have thousands of dams like that you think about you know what we're looking at for water temperature increases if if we could just clear the landscape of unneeded dams we would be in such good shape um we have a lot of work but you know we're fish people right and and most of the time people think about themselves as people so we, we're thinking about the safety that's important um the fish is secondary but having a pretty broad task force, there was good cross-cutting discussions like, you know, we can't, it is very difficult to manage the safety aspects of, you know, three, four, 5,000 dams in the state. So the only way that we can manage that task is to lighten the load, lighten the portfolio of them. So, you know, really there were some safety managers that, was, that were really not thinking environmentally, but really helping to make the case for dam removal and that, you know, two staff people in the dam safety program cannot really handle 3,500 dams. Uh, you know, we're going to have to lighten the load. Um, there are recommendations in that task force report for dam removal funding. There's uh, recommendations in there for annual amounts of money just to help fund uh, engineering and feasibility to set dam removals up. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff, but I'll be honest, that was a report, right? Um, that's not law. It didn't immediately turn into uh, legislative action and the work to get it turned into law programs funding is in front of us now that the task force report is done. And then um, I would say at least for, for my involvement, you know, probably about three weeks before the task force report got finalized, you know, we were beginning discussions about what's the legislative approach look like now. I mean, a report's only as good as the action that follows behind it. And uh, so I think it's gonna take all of us a lot of work but I think all of the dam safety concerns, the aging infrastructure and the, the environmental benefits of removal are all much more in focus and, and much more a conversation now. Uh, it's a tragedy that, um, you know, it takes a tragedy to make some, a problem um, visible enough to get people's attention. But I think we're in a good shape, but a lot of work ahead of us to kind of turn a nice report into to actual policy. Dave, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, thanks for another uh, another question kind of about dams because we've got a lot in Michigan and um, 
you know, probably a lot need to go or are, some are being talked about and some are higher profile. And one of those that's higher profile is the, uh, the Boardman River, Traverse City, the Fish Pass, Pro- Fish Pass Project. High, pretty high profile. Um, you know, we're kind of in the Grand Rapids, West Michigan area. It's not high profile for us. <clears throat> But certainly, those folks in Traverse City, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, does Michigan TU have any sort of official stance on that project? Yeah, so I'll take that, of course. Um, we do not have an official stance from the State Council of Michigan TU. We've uh, largely deferred to our local chapter who um, oversees the Boardman, the Adams chapter. They do have policy and some opinions. Um, they have some general ones and some very specific ones about what fish get passed during the uh, the research period of time. Um, Michigan TU has not really sat down to specifically weigh in on that. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure whether we will, um, right? So, you know, some, some agencies decided that they were doing the research and they wanted to do it on that river. They raised the funds, they're going to do it. Now it is on temporary legal hold, but I'm not sure the judge also really necessarily cares our opinion about the fish project um, in in his decision on moving forward. So um, I'm not sure whether at this point, you know, supporting or, you know, opposing it is, is, um, is relevant, but I would say that our local chapter has, uh, has taken position on that. And um, yeah, if if anybody needs help kind of finding the Adams chapters uh, policies and stances, I can help do that, or you can find them online. Okay, great. Uh, so a couple other questions. Uh, and these, these got addressed a little earlier, but maybe there's some insight. Um, you know, during this time of COVID, it's been an outdoor experience time for a lot of folks. We've been like, all right, I got nothing else to do. I'm going to go out and ex- experience the outside. Um, TU member numbers, those up or down? Uh, DNR fishing licenses, up or down? Any reports there? Um, you know, I think Dan's will probably be the uh, the exciting stats. Um, I have not looked uh, recently, admittedly, uh, at our membership numbers. I mean, I would generally say that um, for about the last 10, 12 years, we've, we've slowly increased uh, TU membership in the state of Michigan. It's typically gone up a couple percent a year. Um, I just don't know, uh, admittedly, what it is uh, this past year. The, yeah, I was just scrolling through my email here because I've got, I know I've got an email in here with some really cool data. Um, let me see if I, I, give me one second, I'm pulling this up. But I mean, anecdotally, well, I mean, we know not just anecdotally, I can tell you, right. Um, yeah, we're up, you know, geez. Six and a half percent or so year over year from 19 to 20. Um, and that's our top, you know, those are our top line figures. The, you know, so obviously one of the things that, that we see, you know, much more on the fishing side than we do on the hunting side, non resident license sales uh, are much more active on the fishing side than they are on the, on the hunting side. So, you know, to some extent, that number may not jump out to folks the same way, you know, in the way that you might think, because, you know, okay, six and a half percent, that's decent. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not mind blowing. But when you think about where most of that growth would have had to come, it would have had to come from resident license sales. That has to first offset, you know, a decline in non-resident sales and then grow beyond that. So when you think about it that way, it's 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 not insignificant. And What's really exciting, I think we saw something like a 43% increase in license sales among females. And, you know, so if we, if we start to think about, you know, what the, you know, what the changing face of, you know, anglers in Michigan is and what, you know, the changing face of angler or hunters are in Michigan, you know, we're starting to see, you know, we're starting to see some of those demographic shifts that I think we all you know, we all recognize are extremely important for us to sustain, you know, to say, sustain what we do. 
Now, whenever, whenever I get asked about increases in license sales, I also get asked about, well, you know, surely, you know, now, you know, you guys have all the, the money you need and we'll see a, you know, we'll see a bump in revenue um, and did see a, a, a bump in revenue in 2020. We also saw, you know, we have a lot of fixed costs that also, that also increase every year as well. So the, the increase in revenue doesn't necessarily correlate with the same kind of increase on, on the license side in one year. But again, you know, then the challenge really becomes for us, once those folks found, found their way to the outdoors, how do we keep them there? And, you know, how do we not let this become anomalous from one year to the next? And, you know, our marketing and outreach folks are, are actively thinking about that question. We're also active with with RBFF, the national uh, the national organization, you know, Recreation Boating and Fishing Foundation. RBFF has been watching these numbers very carefully. They're also trying to understand, you know, what what has motivated this change. Is it, you know, is it that, you know, our core license buyers are those people who've always woken up and say, you know, I'm going to make time to go hunting, fishing, camping, whatever their thing is. Um, you know, we we have those folks pretty reliably every single year. Um, last year, was that increase attributable to folks who woke up in the morning and said, you know, I have time to go hunting, fishing, camping, whatever it is that they do. It's a little bit different. I'm going to make time versus I have time. Um, and so for those, so if that's, if that's what happened for those, you know, now that we're not competing with soccer practice and piano lessons and all the other kind of stuff, you know, how is it that we, you know, how is it that we help continue to support people to prioritize, you know, hunting and fishing activities, you know, as, as part of their family recreation. And we don't know enough about that yet. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about, you know, some of the, I guess, maybe psychological dynamics behind COVID and what, what contributed to people getting outdoors. Um, but there's, there's a lot for us to learn there. And as we do, we're going to better understand what motivates people to get outdoors. So now we have a cohort that's sort of self-identified because they're new or, you know, new licensed buyers. Now we've got a chance to really talk to those folks and understand, all right, what motivated you to come here and do these things? And if we can understand that absent, you know, a global pandemic, that gives us a lot of business intelligence that we can then use in the future for, outreach and communications and that kind of thing to further motivate people to get outdoors and go hunting, go fishing, whatever their thing is. Hey, thank you, Dan. Um, uh, you know, so I've got, we're a little over an hour here. Uh, we were gonna kind of wrap up about now. Uh, but I've got one other question uh, that came from Steve Gatz. It's kind of an interesting one. And uh, I, I, admittedly, I don't know a whole lot about it, uh, but he asks, in terms of steam, stream rehabilitation, are there any thoughts of TU joining the Potawatomi tribe with the rehabilitation of the Dwajiak River? Um, I, any thoughts there? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> so for the last, though, maybe three years or so, we have been... Um, more active on the Dowagiac. Basically, uh, the Pucker Street Dam, kind of on the lower Dowagiac, is um, has now been removed. It's uh, they're still finishing restoration work. That has opened up um, an incredible amount of opportunity and potential for that watershed. Um, it is an important watershed and cold water fishery in that corner of the state. And um, I think with the promise of that dam removal, people immediately started thinking like, what are the opportunities for the watershed? Um, what is the resource like? How is the habitat? How is the access? And so uh, several years ago, <clears throat> we, uh, we played some, you know, a small role in just trying to help a group of people, the local chapter, some Illinois chapter, some other uh, organizations, and just some citizens try to start rethinking about um, uh, what the river will need from us. That's continued on. Um, our Kalamazoo Valley chapter is uh, participating in that. Um, there's actually uh, quite a 
quite a few new folks who've even started conversating about um, either making a new TU chapter or just operating for a while as a subcommittee of the Kalamazoo Valley chapter. So there's a lot of energy there. Um, and we are participating in some of those discussions about what's next for the Dowagiac. Um, I will admittedly say that um, I'm mostly aware of kind of that larger effort to, to, to really grab hold of the Dowagiac and, and see some opportunities. I'm not as familiar what, with what might be specifically referenced as um, the Potawatomi tribes restoration project. Um, but yeah, we're, I mean, we do everything in partnership and, and um, if that tribe is, is, is doing something unique there, that's not kind of what I'm thinking of and, and they would invite us, I would be, you know, we'd, we'd always be glad. We do pretty much everything we do in partnership with other people and other, uh, other organizations. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for uh, uh, filling us in on that. Um, and I had no idea that that was going on at all. Not that I'm all that aware of much of anything, but that was interesting. Um, so there's, uh, you know, some others. Uh, if you guys want to keep on, I'll keep throwing questions your way. Um, I I'll leave it up to you at this point. I, I, I can stand by and keep throwing. I can hang around for a little bit. Yeah. Okay, here's here's a good question. How how are we progressing in the new consent decree regarding the tribal fishing rights? Well, obviously, there's uh, not a lot I can say about that. Uh, those are confidential negotiations. I can tell you that um, we continue to meet. Um, you know, obviously, we've the 2000 consent decree has been extended uh, twice now because we have not concluded. Um, we've not concluded those negotiations that have resulted in a new consent decree. Um, so we're, we're going to keep at it and, and keep after it. Um, but that's, that's about all I can say. Okay. Has there been internal discussions about uh, creel limits for steelhead in specific streams in Michigan? And I should say that on May 11th, we do have DNR staff, uh, Brian Gunderman, Mark Tonello, Jay Wesley, along with Kristen Thomas of MITU will be here. And Jay specifically wanted to have that discussed on that show on May 11th. So I guess, is there been any official position or information on that at this point? Not that's gotten to my desk yet, um, but, but that doesn't mean that that's not in play or that's not been, you know, that's not been discussed within fisheries division. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's, it's in, in, indicative of where their thinking is, if that's something in particular that Jay wants to talk to you guys about. Um, that, that that must be something that's on their mind that they want to try and get some feedback on. Um, but it's not something that's come up to my desk yet. Okay. Uh, Brian, I do have a question. A couple of years ago, there was an article in the MIT magazine about Grand Rapids Whitewater that wasn't exactly favorable. Have, with the questions about the design issue several years ago, have those concerns been addressed, do you know, at this point to the satisfaction of MITU? Um, <clears throat> well, there... The project um, got broken into a phase one and a phase two. Um, so there's the uh, the lower or the downstream, you know, roughly half of the project, which proceeded first. Um, yes, we've largely, um, we've gotten to the point where we've had discussion. We understand what the, the schematics and designs of the lower half look like. Um, as far as the upper half, which is really the significant portion, um, it is my understanding today. I mean, we, we keep a dialogue with, with the team of folks working on that, but um, it's my understanding that a final design has not been arrived at for phase two. So, um, you know, until, until, you know, a final design or something very close to a final design actually comes together for that. We, you know, we probably won't spend a lot of time um, in reviewing and participating, but, but when that becomes available and it gets ironed out, we'll certainly review. Yeah, we yeah. still have questions. I mean, it's still, it's still a noble effort. I think it'll be a good project, but um, <clears throat> as you noted that article, the, the, you know, the details matter. And, and whether it turns out to be an okay project or a great project, whether cold water fish end up passing, you know, worse, better, or the same as they currently enjoy. It really depends on very, very uh, minute details and hydraulics and engineering. Yeah. So, I, can, I can add a little onto that too, that that's a project where obviously, you know, in, involved with, there are, 
you know, there, that, that's a, it's a real challenging, it's just a real challenging project um, for, for a lot of reasons. It's highly complex, right? I mean, you've got, you know, from the perspective of the Department of Natural Resources, and I would say, you know, I'll speak for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but we're, we're very concerned about, you know, the efficacy of a lamprey barrier that's not, that's not one of the cofferdams, right? So we've got we've to solve that problem. And there's been, you know, there's been some interesting work that's been done in that space. We have a, a number of endangered mussel species that that inhabit, you know, certain stretches of the, you know, or those sections of the Grand River. So we've got to solve for that problem as well. And then, you know, a little outside of our wheelhouse, but one of the, you know, one of the challenges is that, you know, you've got to account for, you know, you got to account for, you know, floods right and high water events and how do you you know how do you handle that um how do you how do you balance the need for you know again kind of protecting those that human health and safety and and and, and property uh values with you know the kinds of you know water flow and hydrologic characteristics that you know some folks on the recreation side really want to try and develop in that area and then you know, how do we do all of those things and sustain, you know, an active fishery there? I mean, those are, those are all kind of easy things to say, but they are, they are incredibly complex, you know, challenges. So, you know, there are still a lot of active conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers, the Fisheries Commission, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the City of Grand Rapids, the Whitewater people, all of, you know, all of those folks are all trying to figure out if, the, the values that they're bringing to the table can all get checked off with one single design. And that's, that's very difficult and, and takes a lot of, a lot of conversations and a lot of going back to the drawing board and that kind of thing. So there's still a lot of active discussion, you know, toward, towards that, but I wouldn't characterize them as being really close right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one other question, other, is there legislation in the pipeline or active that we need to be aware of both in a, from, a, from a pro basis and from a con basis? Yes, always. And they are? <laughs> um, well, that's, that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> nother hour. Um, <laughs> you'll have to have me back for that. Um, yeah, no. Um, you know, there's quite a few things of interest. You know, uh, there's been at least one other one that was mentioned I saw in the chat about um, um, renewables. Um, you know, right now, I, I will say that I am, I'm pretty focused on some of our issues with the Great Lakes. Um, the commercial fishing um, legislative package has been something that we've been dealing with for what is it, like five five or six years five years um, yeah the legislature just seems uh unable to uh accomplish uh accomplish a package um so we're hung up there um you know i will say that right now is not the worst period of time that i've ever seen um but uh there is a variety of stuff there is a variety of stuff and um you know we'll look for email action alerts from us um, usually when it comes time, I, I guess I would say what, what we usually try to do, my philosophy has been all of you are very busy. You receive, um, you know, probably hundreds or dozens of emails a day. Um, if we send too many, you're probably going to de start deleting our emails without reading them. Um, we try to solve as much of uh, these problems as possible. And when we can't, and when we need our members, truly, you'll see an action alert. And uh, that's kind of my promise is to not scare you or uh, to ask for your help when it's not truly needed. Because I hope that when you do see that from us, you, you know that we are at an impasse and uh, it won't get fixed without your help. Um, so always look for those. And uh, we do try to write them in our magazine. And um, Taylor's been good and available to uh, to go into deep details, but um, there, there's, you know, there's a few, but it's not the busiest period um, that we've seen before either. Lance. I find it interesting that the energy renewal bill, uh, the expansion that's coming from the UP. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's uh, my opinion. I think that um, 
I, I think it's a good move. I think it's sensible. There's not a lot of good reasons not to um, expand that. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I didn't mean to be too brief, but um, right now I, I would just say, Lance, on the legislative front, we're we're getting ready to try to accomplish a lot. There's not a lot of bills I want to, you know, keep going on and on about, but you know, we're trying to find money right now and convince the legislature to um, fund the water withdrawal um, council's recommendations. Similar to a dam safety task force, we put out a report, a biennial report, and it lays out what the smartest, most needed investments are to help um, improve our groundwater management. And so unfortunately we don't really have like a bill on that, but we are trying very hard to get um, uh, to do education on that so we can seek those investments. And as uh, alluded to earlier, I think with uh, George George's question, um, you know, starting now, starting a couple months ago and probably unfortunately for the next year, maybe two years, we're gonna be working very hard to get um, a lot of policy change in the dam, dam safety, dam removal funding space. And uh, we don't have those bills yet, but um, that'll be a, a big heavy lift. So you'll you'll start hearing more and more from us on those, but those those are more to come. Pro action. Uh, Joyce was asking about the uh, status of the project in the Upper Manistee River as well, too. Yeah, um, yeah, great. Thank you for uh, for those who might not know. Um, you know, we're working with I think about twenty partner groups. Um, to really try to do some intensive restoration and enhancement to the Upper Manistee. Um, it's really a, a kind of a long-term um, multiple scale project where we're, you know, we're looking at every tributary, we're looking at all the work that needs to be done. But we've really started and identified as a group um, that the section between yellow trees and CTC, so really, you know, uh, a big part of the heart, heart of that water, um, really has a, a, a paucity of wood debris and fish habitat. And again, we've seen sand kind of moving and relocating. And so <clears throat> that is kind of the first major scale project that we're undertaking. Um, uh, we have some funding support from federal uh, programs and from the State Department of Natural Resources, from private uh, members, from other groups. And um, COVID did end up you know, sort of taking a 12 month bite out of that um, as things were delayed and field seasons were restricted. So at this point, we're thinking that we will, um, we will be able to uh, execute what we call the hinge cutting portion of that, where we can drag wood in or uh, drop wood in from the riparian zone. But the bulk of the project, that particular project where we will be helicoptering, you know, much more extensive amounts of trees, we'll probably have to wait until the 2022 field season. Okay. Um, any update on the, Mon the mine uh, in Menominee? Um, so uh, a couple, couple updates on that front, you know, Michigan TU um, Conservation Committee did um, put together a policy on mining. It's, it's a pretty universal policy. It was not meant to uh, necessarily specifically address one mine. It was supposed to be a, a good guiding document for us um, reviewing any mine, but we did take a position also that uh, we are uh, opposed to the uh, back 40 mine as it is currently uh, proposed in permits. Um, you know, um, what was it probably a month, two months ago, I lose track, maybe, maybe longer. <clears throat> there was a judge's, uh, an administrative judge ruling on the uh, wetlands mostly, but also the inland lakes and streams permits. And, um, um, you know, I, I have lost track on exactly where that is. I'm sure it's uh, probably an attempt to, to appeal to circuit courts, but um, it, was a, it was a decent ruling. It was, uh, it was balanced. It wasn't all, um, you know, all of what you might expect, certainly on the inland lakes and streams permit side, but um, on the wetlands, it was, um, you know, it was pretty strong and it, and it um, I think it uh, was forcing things back for further review and further information. So, um, that's probably it for right now, but um, you know, Michigan TU did do a policy on that, and um, and as far as I know, that mine is still in various phases of uh, 
of its permitting uh, needs. What else? I like the speed round. <laughs> Any other questions for anyone? If if we're winding down, I'll just I, I just want to put in a, a plug um, for for Brian. Um, he's you know he's a one man show in a lot of ways for you know all the places that he has to be, and uh, I've had the the pleasure and, and privilege of working alongside Brian for you know 15 years, and uh, you know the amount of work that he cranks out individually and the way that he represents. Uh, Michigan Trout Unlimited is uh, is incredible, and uh, so I can't. You know, I want to. I don't ever want to miss an opportunity to to let you guys know what a what a tr great asset you have in Brian. You know, leading your organization, representing to you. Um, just he's he's phenomenal, and and you know projects on so many fronts. I don't know how he, I don't know how he does it, and um, so he, he's a great. He's a great friend and a, and a great colleague. And I'll tell you, he's got, he's got my cell phone number. So anytime he needs to bend my ear about a cold water fishery issue, um, he, he does it. So, you know, I want you guys to know that through Brian, you've got direct access to me. So anytime, you know, anytime there's an issue that pops up on your radar, get it on his and Brian can get it on mine. Thank you, Dan. Well, excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you both for being with us tonight. We appreciate your insight and answering all the questions, your patience with us. Um, maybe uh, we can tentatively schedule something a year from now for the next day of the trout event. Anytime. Good. Anyone else? Any further questions? Anything else? Brian, Dan, anything else you'd like to add before we close out? Thanks for having me. I, I again, you know, with um, the last year, I uh, did not get around to see uh, members and chapter board members um, like normal. So, even though um, this is electronic, it was nice to be invited. So, thank you. Maybe face to face next year. We can, we'll hope so. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, uh, thank you, Dan, for participating too. I know your time is valuable, and you're pulled in a lot of directions. So thanks for being with us tonight. Um, no, my pleasure. I so appreciate the invitation. Don't ever hesitate. Um, you know, this is a this is one of the best parts of my job is being able to to talk to talk to folks who share the same passion that I do, and and make sure that I'm doing the job in the way that that you guys think is is the right way to do it. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, quick plug for our next show, which is yeah. going to be in April 27th. It will feature Trout Unlimited national staff, specifically Jamie Vaughn, Nicole DeMole, and Jake Lemon. Uh, so please join us. Uh, that'll be it. And uh, everybody's unmuted. If you want to say thanks, uh, we'll wrap it up in just a moment. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, I do have one thing. Someone asked about the White River Project we're working on. If you want to send us just an email through the chapter, our, our chapter website, I can get some details back to you. That there have been some initial work done, and I can share that information if I get your email address. Well done, indeed. Thank you all, and have yourselves a great night. Thank you, gentlemen.